and uh, um, saline at room temperature. And so they, uh, they did really find that uh, there is a decrease um, of complication measured by the strength of the muscle, especially um, uh, the biceps, triceps, and deltoid muscle um, after surgery. And so um, this means that uh, with enough cooling, you um, avoid to injure nerves, you avoid to uh, get high temperature, and um, which um, where afterwards the incidence of post-operative paresis uh, due to the lesion of the cervical nerves are decreased. Um, just another, um, just another publication from the group of Maria Amirati, uh, where they um, compared the surface temperature um, during an intradural anterior clinoidectomy, so which means uh, drilling away the anterior clinoid at the skull base, and they compared the, um, the temperature between high-speed diamond burr and ultrasonic bone curette, which can also be used for bone um, ablation. And um, so they saw um, that uh, they measured it with the temperature probe, just at the optic nerve and also at the um, ACP. Um, and uh, so they found uh, that um, even when you use um, um, ultrasonic device, bone curate, uh, there is a higher high temperature. And in this anal analysis, um, a little bit higher temperature than using the, um, the drill when you, when you have got proper cooling uh, uh, when using diamond uh, burrs during um, anterior skull base surgery. So now I would like to come to the topic. Um, how does generally a neurosurgeon learn to drill? So um, certainly it is very different from country to country. And even in Germany, it's um, very different from hospital to hospital, depending on whether you're, um, you, know, you are doing residency in a university hospital or a big city hospital or in a smaller uh, hospital with um, mainly um, a clinical work without any academic work. So um, the first thing and one, uh, one of the first um, um, procedures that a young resident uh, learns, and I think this is almost the same all over the world, is uh, to put a simple burr hold with a cranial perforator or with a hand drill. So to put um, ventricular drainage or ICP monitoring, uh, evacuate epi or subdural hematomas or uh, putting in ventricular uh, shunts. And um, so even it is, it is a quite straightforward instrument and um, it is a really um, a nice device where the automatic releasing system uh, will uh, in almost every case enable the preservation of the dura, uh, the handling should be should be uh, learned. So this is the proper handling, just putting in the perforator perpendicular to the bone and not any rounding movements. So just keep it, hold it, and just put the put the pressure until it stops automatically. And but it's a little bit exaggerated video, but sometimes you see this, like, you know, running, rounding, and, um, and um, so just in intentionally uh, doing this. And uh, so this is, the device is not developed um, to use it like that. So, so if, you, if you use the device like, you know, in, in, in this manner, it can easily happen that you tear the door or the releasing system doesn't stop. And so, this is just very basic stuff, but um, important for the, for the system, just to work properly. Um, next level is um, doing craniotomies. So simple craniotomies over the convexity, uh, first lateral to the sinus and uh, later on um, just beneath the sinus. And so you do a craniotomy using the craniotome and uh, so for proper use of the cranium, I think Mr. Mauch will uh, talk a little, a little bit more in detail. And then um, one keeps further on doing craniotomies at the skull base, especially uh, for just as an example, craniotomies where you do uh, do need some, some superficial high-speed drilling. And the best example, I think, is the general approach. So in general approach, you do the burr hole just at the behind the um, anterior temporal line, which you can do with the, uh, with the drill or with the cranial perforator. 
and then do a craniotomy, and then uh, you've got the sphenoid ridge, which needs to be drilled. And so I think this is one nice example for the first step for using um, high-speed drilling, not directly at the skull base, but just, uh, just superficially. And uh, so, uh, for example, in this approach, one can learn different things. Uh, this video shows how difficult it is when you use the high-speed drill and try to do um, try to do uh, drilling verticality. So just um, demonstrating it in a slow uh, motion. So in this direction, vertical, and the drill is um, of course working clockwise. So this is very dangerous. Especially when you do not have uh, have the power on full, so you are not doing high speed but low speed. Then um, you can see the wheel effect here. So there is a wheel effect, and the wheel effect occurs when you have low speed, and so that that can be very dangerous. So you are just sliding away with the drill to the side, to the right side. Um, it's the other way when you do it uh, horizontally. So you are perpendicular to the edge. The edges are looking upwards, and you are drilling horizontally. This is quite safe because the drill is drilling clockwise, and so you're just moving. Additional. Now the drill is on, and and now you just drill along the edge into the direction where you anyway want to drill. And so this is um, this is a maneuver which is uh, which is much safer. So um, you don't even when a, uh, a wheel effect happens, then um, it will be okay. Um, another situation is when you've got a, a bony edge looking upwards, but you want to drill to the left side, and the drill is um, drilling clockwise. So this is also a situation which is safer because you put pressure to the edge, so you put pressure to the left side and uh, you move your drill to the left side accordingly. And so this is uh, quite comfortable, comfortable to, to uh, drill and um, the, the happening uh, occurrence of a wheel effect is also uh, much, much lower. Um, another situation when you put the drill more from upwards so perpendicular onto the edge, it's a little bit more difficult, but the drill is uh, drilling clockwise. So when you want to do vertical dissection, vertical uh, drilling, then um, this is also a situation which you can handle much better than, uh, than in other, other situations. So the drill, you're uh, leading the drill upwards and vertically, but, uh, but you're put on, uh, you're coming from, from uh, a steeper angle. And so, especially at the Swainoid wing, uh, you get this situation, you've got a bony edge, which is uh, looking uh, downwards and uh, you want to remove it, so like, in, like in this situation here. And so uh, this is a nice uh, situation for, for high speed drilling, of course, because you put the pressure to the bone and you can handle, even, uh, you can handle it even when the wheeling effect um, uh, should occur. So when you when you drill in this direction to the right side and uh, you're you're ablating the bone from down to up, then it is comfortably done and the high speed drilling uh, can be done very safely. And in every situation, of course, you need to rest your hand. You you, you need to rest your hand at the edge of the craniotomy, and. Of course, you never do high-speed drilling just freehand where you don't have any um, resting of your hands. So that is, uh, that is uh, too, uh, diff uh, too difficult and too uh, dangerous. Um, the size of the drill, as you know, it's not always safe when you use the uh, smallest burr. So especially at the skull base, for example, when you use a small rosen burr, uh, just right away at the beginning of the drilling of the screen or the and Then you just drill in uh, small holes and you can slip away. So you can easily slip away. So, um, so it is not recommendable to use a very small uh, uh, burr just right at the beginning of the procedure. So it is even more dangerous because you're uh, drilling in small holes and you can get into, into new vascular structures just beneath. And um, so the first thing is to use a larger burr. 
and then you're you're not uh, in the situation where you can slip off the edge and uh, you can grow comfortably the the uh, the edge of the bone and then later on move to smaller smaller areas when you when you um, when you um, have drilled uh, the the inner part and just leave the outer shell for example and then you you can use the um, the smaller drill in order to um, to go further so um, I would now like to go further and um, and then proceed to some um, to some um, procedures which um, which is more special and um, uh, which is maybe a little bit too special for the for the uh, residents or for for younger uh, surgeons but um, but uh, which is one, just two examples of, uh, of drilling at the skull base um, where um, you need to think about these, um, these um, techniques and uh, where high-speed drilling is really, um, really, really helpful. So the first thing is um, anterior clinodectomy. Anterior clinodectomy is, um, is a very common procedure, drilling procedure, in order to get um, to the parasolar region, to the super, um, to the superior orbital fissure, or to uh, to the orbital apex, and also to um, uh, at some time to to the cavernous sinus if indicated. And um, so there is um, it's a it's a quite sophisticated um, um, drilling at the skull base. And um, so um, you need to have a lot of experience. So it is usually not uh, not provided to do it, um, you know, during the residency. But um, after after you've got a neurosurgeon, and if you want to get into the skull base program, then um, one get one gets familiar with uh, with anterior clinodectomy or other um, techniques and, and things like that. So um, looking at the anterior clinoidal process, um, it's quite a difficult structure. When on the left side, you see um, the ACP from, um, from the intracranial into um, in a posterior medial to anterolateral um, view. And uh, so you see the uh, optic canal. This is the bony you know, connection, which is called the optic strut. It's the ACP, so the anterior clinoidal process and uh, the superior orbital fissure and so the lesser, um, lesser splenoid wing. So this is uh, the, uh, the, the view from, uh, from inside. This is the view from the orbital side, optic strut, the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure. So this is just the bony structure, um, which you can see. And now, now it comes that um, you've got a lot of, you know, uh, you know a lot of uh, important nerves and uh, vessels there. So first of all, you've got the, the optic nerve, which is running into the optic canal, and just lateral to it, uh, the um, internal carotid artery. And then you've got all the nerves, which run through the superior orbital fissure, which is uh, oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, lacrimal nerve, and also the ophthalmic division and uh, uh, of trigeminal and um, and the obtusant nerve. So they are just just beneath to it. This is the form of fundum. And um, so, so it is a very, very delicate and very uh, difficult anatomical site. And when you perform drilling here at the ACP, one can imagine you really need to have control over your high-speed flow. Otherwise, uh, you can get a big, big catas catastrophe. So when, um, when you drill off the uh, clinal process and um, and um, so release the structures you can uh, see the optic nerve uh, along with the optic uh, nerve sheath and um, and then the you can get access into the superior orbital fissure you can get access to the distal carotid um, dual wing this is the optic strut temporal lobe frontal lobe and um, so this enables you a wide exposure of that, but, uh, but within the limited um, area, um, 
um, of, uh, of the neurovascular structures um, around. Um, this is the meningo orbital band, where I can, uh, um, I can talk about a little bit later. So uh, when do you do generally these um, anterior clinoidectomies? Um, it is very useful for resection of tumors involving the optic canal. And uh, so especially meningiomas of the tobacco cellae or planum, planum anterior clinal process or mediastinal wing and um, also for sphenoorbital meningiomas. Um, rare tumors which involve the superior orbital fissure and, or, of course, um, different uh, vascular pathologies uh, like uh, paraclinoidal aneurysms. Um, you can tailor the clinodectomy. So it, it does not mean clinodectomy is a complete clinodectomy in every case. You can tailor it so you can choose the amount of bone the dissection according to the pathology uh, which you have and which you want to treat. So you can do a partial clinodectomy or in, in some cases you can do a complete clinodectomy where you remove all the clinoid and have got a larger exposure. And also well, there are different techniques to do the clinoidectomy. So as you know, you, one can do partial clinoidectomy from intradural. And uh, there are a lot of um, pathologies where you just keep with, um, with the partial clinoidectomy and you can treat the lesion. And there are others where you need to do a complete clinoidectomy extradurally in order to get further on. So for example, oh, when, when I operate um, tumors in this superior orbital fissure, I do an extradural clinoidectomy uh, in order to get to the, um, to the superior orbital fissure. Otherwise, it can be very, very um, difficult to, do, to get there. So um, just an example for the interior, um, intradural um, anterior clinoidectomy. Um, so the dura, is exposed over the ACP. This is the temporal lobe, this is the frontal lobe. And then first the dura uh, is incised over the ACP and then the anterior clinoid process is um, exposed under the microscope. And then um, the drilling starts. So usually start at the medial cortical margin of the ACP. And then uh, you, when drilled um, the um, when drill inside, so from inside to outside, that the cortical, uh, the cortex of the bone is um, left, and um, so this will enable the, uh, that uh, you are safe with the drilling. But however, you need, you always need to know, you need to be careful that uh, you don't get with the drill anyway too too far left, where you didn't get the oculomotor nerve, or anyway too deep, where you can kill the uh, the carotid artery, and of course not too too. Um, too much medially and inferiorly uh, where the optic nerve is. So when the clinodectomy is performed, you can you can follow the optic nerve, and the optic nerve is exposed here after the um, clinodectomy. And uh, here on the right side, you see the very very near anatomical, um, the uh, near the anatomical neighborhood, you know, uh, of the uh, oculomotor nerve and. The, the ocular motor, motor nerve runs into the wall of the carnosinus, but you, of course you don't see it when you do it intradurally afterwards. When you do the clinodectomy and you, you go too far lateral, then you can kill the ocular motor nerve. And you even uh, do not notice this other. Um, uh, um, when you do a monitoring of the ocular motor nerve, then you can uh, hear it's uh, first signs, but uh, usually it's too late when you hear it. And so. So this is a um, you, one needs to remember that um, that um, too far too far lateral is bad for the for the oculomotor nerve. Um, the other technique to do the anterior clinodectomy is extradurally. So you peel off the dura extradurally. This is the frontal dura. This is the temporal dura, and um, so it's it's only in um, black and white, but. Um, then when you peel off the dura, you see the so-called meningo orbital band, which is the frontotemporal um, uh, dural fold, in other name. 
And so um, the Meningo orbital band um, uh, is automatically left and then one needs to cut the Meningo orbital band in order to get further and then go on <clears throat> and, um, and peel off the, the outer layer of the dura. And uh, in, uh, with this um, peeling off of the outer um, layer, um, you can you can see the inner layer and then the inner layer covers and protects the uh, nerves in the superior orbital fissure. This is the meningo orbital band, this meningo orbital band. And so when, when this band is cut, the peeling off will be much easier and you can get access to the, uh, to the superior orbital fissure. And of course, you need to drill the anterior final process, otherwise uh, it's not possible um, to go there. So this is a completely different technique and um, a little bit in, um, a little bit more sophisticated, but uh, when you know um, how far you can cut the uh, mini orbital band and um, you have got the technique to peel off the dura, then it's, uh, it's a safe procedure. So uh, for the ACP drilling, uh, first uh, the ACP is drilled, uh, the cancellous part is drilled, and, uh, and then uh, when the cortical shell is left at the ACP, so this is the ACP and, and uh, which is drilled, then the outer shell cortical part uh, can be um, shelled out with the dissector. And um, so um, I think uh, this is quite uh, safe to do it because the outer cortical shell is very, and then very thin and then you can just release the bone um, um, at the connection there. So, um, so also for anterior clinodectomy, the same holds that uh, one should not begin with the smallest uh, burr. So when you begin with the 2.3 uh, Rosenberg, this is the ACP, just, uh, you just drill in small holes and then it's, it's really, it's really um, dangerous when, you, when you, you're suddenly having a small hole which directs to the optic nerve. And so in these cases, it's much better to begin with this, uh, with a larger one. Of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the Rosenberg is limited. So you, um, you switch off uh, quite uh, quickly to the diamond burr. And uh, with the diamond burr, you, you're much safer. It's, it takes a little bit more time, but uh, then uh, the first step is much better to do it with a, with a larger, um, larger burr. So this is just a very short example of a meningioma, which is uh, involving the optic canal and where um, I did a, a partial intradural clinodectomy, intraoperative view of the right side. And uh, so you see the optic nerve and the meningioma. This is the clinoid, which is now, uh, which is now drilled. And um, first um, with the Rosenberg. And um, it's all done intradurally, so so just the uh, the dura is resected, and now switching to the diamond burr, and um, so the cortical shell is uh, just left, and um, the ACP is um, is now drilled there, and so um, this is just uh, the uh, the first steps and the first sequence of the anterior um, clinodectomy, just for an example. So now. Um, as the last topic, I would like to switch to another area where high-speed drilling um, is needed and is very important. I do not want to go into, you know, very sophisticated um, areas like uh, petrosal drilling, petrosectomies, and uh, so on, because I, uh, I think this is a really uh, different and uh, exhaustive. Um, um, topic where you can talk the whole day about. And so um, in this setting, I just want to demonstrate, uh, you know, just an, another example where high-speed drilling is uh, needed, not all the, for all the procedure, but uh, for a very important part, um, um, part of the surgery, especially um, I want to focus on surgery of uh, vestibular schwannomas. So, um, that means high speed drilling at the internal auditory canal. So how, how can we get there? It's uh, quite standard um, for every neurosurgeon that um, well, we use the retrosigmoid approach, which is uh, shown here, a lateral suboccipital craniotomy, and then um, the cerebellum is retracted 
And uh, this gives you the view to this uh, CPA, the cerebral pontine angle, where, um, where uh, at the cerebral pontine angle coming from the vestibular nerve, all the vestibular schwannomas arise. So this is just the basic view from behind and um, a view from a semi-sitting position. Um, another anatomic, <clears throat> anatomic um, photograph uh, which illustrates nicely the very complicated um, um, structures and also the, um, the near surroundings of the neurovascular um, um, structures here. This is the focus, this is the eighth nerve and just in front the seventh nerve the trigeminal nerve here and the lower cranial nerves. And so if you divide the nerves, you can see the seven here, which is more ventral when you come from, from retrosic. And, um, and um, so the, um, the pica here, um, and here on the, on the right side, uh, you see the, um, um, you see further on the lower inferior vestibular nerve, which is cut and the superior vestibular nerve, cochlear nerve and the facial nerve. And um, so, when you are you, when you're in a position um, to to do the drilling here, you really need to be careful. You've got the nerves which you want to preserve just beneath your drill, and um, as you know, vestibular schwannomas uh, almost always have got some part um, part of tumor in the you know internal auditory canal. So you need to open the internal auditory canal and do a high speed drilling there. And um, so um, this is, these are just the nerves which are lying there. And when you, when you do the, uh, the drilling and proceed with the drilling, you see first uh, the dura of the internal auditory canal. After opening the dura of the internal auditory canal, uh, the nerves lie in their position, which is always the same in every human, uh, inferior vestibular nerve, superior vestibular nerve in front of you, and then the facial nerve um, uh, ventrally upwards and the cochlear nerve ventrally downwards. And the tumor is lying in the canal or extending into the fundus and in large tumors, it's, uh, the cisternal part is there. So um, other structures where you need to be careful when you do drilling. There are not only nerves and vessels, there's all, um, also the Lorentzian structure. And so when you do a retrosic um, approach and um, uh, want to open the internal auditory canal, you can open the endolymphatic duct or you can open the endolymphatic sac. And so this is one thing which uh, needs to be um, uh, uh, comprehended because when you want to do vestibular schwannomal surgery in order to preserve hearing in very small tumors, then one need to notice that these structures need to be preserved. And you can easily go in with the high speed drill into the, um, into the uh, lymphatic, endolymphatic duct or the sac or into the posterior semicircular canal. And so this is, um, not very good when you want to preserve hearing. So posterior semicircular canal is here, endolymphatic duct, the endolymphatic um, sac, and just medially to it, the juggler bulb. And so you can only drill this area. And one need to know the anatomy that when you go below, you can open the juggler bulb. When you go infralaterally, you can open the endolymphatic sac or the endolymphatic duct. When you go to laterally, you can open the posterior semicircular canal. So the very safe zone is supramatal. So there is bone where it's basically nothing, so you can drill. But in order to open the, uh, the canal, you need to go more downwards. So you need to have the anatomical orientation where to drill. And the most critical part is when you just open the you know, auditory canal too far or low and have got problems with the juggler bulb. So in semi-sitting position, you can get air embolism and things like that. So which can be really, really catas a catastrophe where you open the, you know, uh, the, the, the posterior semicircular canal, the endolymphatic sac, and the patient is not anymore able to hear after surgery. So um, this is very, very important um, to know the anatomy and to know uh, where you can drill.
And also, um, just when you look at the bony structures, and this is a, this is a model of the skull base and um, the right inner auditory canal and the left inner auditory canal. The direction of drilling is also important and the movement um, that you do. So if you want to drill on the right side, a smooth movement from upwards to downwards and then repeat it. So it just, just um, doing a round movement is very, very comfortable in order to, to open the, uh, the internal auditory canal. And so uh, when you do this, you don't get in trouble with slipping away or uh, that, you, uh, that you are getting with, uh, me too from medial with the drill and get in contact with the facial nerve or the corporal nerve. And, so um, on the opposite, on the left side, you just uh, do, of course, the opposite. You put the pressure more into the direction of the petrous bone and uh, then do round movement. So I do a clockwise, uh, clockwise movement in order to, to open the, uh, the internal auditory canal. So just one. Um, example of a patient with a very small vestibular phenoma. Um, I don't know if you do surgery on small vestibular phenomas in Indonesia. So the philosophy for this is of course very different. And I have to say that, uh, that surgery for these kinds of tumors in Germany is also getting uh, uh, less and less because um, of the rise of um, gamma knife and radio surgery. And, um, and also there, are, there is a good argument just uh, to follow the patients. So do, you, you, know, you do not have to do essentially surgery in order to remove the tumor because it's not life threatening. But um, we've got many cases also from Hanover uh, where the patients present with a small tumor, they've got a quite a limit, a limited hearing, but uh, they can still use the phone. And so they, they have to wish uh, to, um, to have the hearing preserved. And so in these cases, I think it's a good indication um, to do the surgery. However, of course, you don't have, you cannot guarantee hearing preservation in, in every case. And when hearing preoperatively is very low, the chances are also low. So just for example, this is a small intramural vestibular schwannoma on the left side with a little bit widening of the inner auditory canal. And um, so this is uh, the view of the surgery in a semi-sitting position and also um, coming from retrosic on the left side. The cerebellum is exposed and um, the cotton is uh, inside the cerebellum is retracted. You see the, the eighth nerve now, you see the petrous bone here and the dura over the inner internal canal is cut and removed and the tumor is inside here so you cannot see at first i use a small rosen bird to open <clears throat> the internal auditory canal and then um then later on um, proceed uh, with the diamond burr and then um first the um the dura is is um exposed in, in the internal auditory canal. So this area is quite safe. You need to be careful in this area, of course. This, so these are the stripes of the dura. Professor Tatajiba and Tübingen calls it Tübingen line. So because over this line, you can easily drill without uh, having anything except of any high juggler bulb, which you, you need to see in the CT. This is the tumor, which is now removed from intracanalicular. And um, so owners are preserved here, all small parts are removed. And as you know, it's difficult um, to look into the fundus with the microscope. So when you use the endoscope, you can finally check and whether everything is removed. And um, so this can be really nicely done with a retrosigmoid approach and even in small tumors, which are in the inner auditory canal. So uh, in my opinion, you don't need to do a middle fossa approach uh, or any alternative to remove this kind of this tumor. And uh, with the addition of the endoscope, you've got a very nice view there. 
left side internal auditory canal, which is grilled open. This is the posterior semicircular canal, which is preserved. So this anatomic relation shows that you need to be careful. There are a few millimeters only to get into this posterior semicircular canal, and um, this can lead to hearing loss when you do that, when you get into the posterior semicircular canal. Um, the last example, uh, many um, vestibular frontoma um, on the right side, so which is already a little bit compressing the brainstem. Um, so also in a semi-sitting position on the right side, now the cerebrum is re retracted here. Now it's a very, very it's a, of course a different um, situation. You don't see the petrous bone, you don't see the auditory canal. So first you need to debulk the tumor. And um, in vestibular schwannoma, you almost never have a situation where the facial nerve runs here, never. And um, the facial nerve is always displaced front and uh, ventrally, ventrally superior or inferiorly. So you never have it here. So you can debulk the tumor here. So first centrally debulk using the ultrasonic aspirator. And um, so the first step is to remove, remove, remove and get space in order to mobilize the, the edges of the tumor. So uh, this tumor get, gets soft. So, and then you can have more anatomical orientation. Otherwise you don't have any orientation. You even don't know where the facial nerve is. And so um, in my view, it's a, 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 the first step should be decompression of the tumor and then, and then mobilizing the tumor just right at the brainstem and then at the brainstem, the exit of the facial nerve is every time the same. So this is the, the place where the facial nerve can be identified anatomically. Of course, you have neuro monitoring and neuro monitoring is really, really important um, to, to check. And this is the facial nerve here. So the facial nerve is coming out of the brainstem do some stimulation there. And then it's possible to follow the facial nerve. So in this case, it was not the, uh, the aim to preserve hearing because the patient didn't hear anymore before, before surgery. So the facial nerve is then followed and followed and the cisternal part of the tumor is then removed stepwise. Once you know where the facial nerve is, um, it is much easier to, to, to remove the tumor. And uh, so the advantage of the semi-sitting position is that one can do the preparation by manually. So you, you can use both hands. You don't have to suction in the left hand. You use both hands and do, do a nice preparation there. So, and then now you can, you can open the internal organ canal. I've let, I always leave some tumor here at the porous um, and do not uh, proceed here um, because the tumor is very adhesive in, in a lot of cases here at the porous. So I start with the drilling of the internal auditory canal. The canal is opened and in the internal auditory canal, you have got the right order of the nerves. So you can one more identify the facial nerve, which is in the standard fashion, which lies um, in the superior part frontally, uh, ventrally. And then it's possible to go to the porous and remove the last part at the porous and you can see nicely the facial nerve there. So I think uh, this, is, uh, this is quite safe to do it uh, because you can lose the facial nerve just right here at the porous when you follow it from cisternally. And so it's in my view better to open it at the internal canal uh, in between identify the facial nerve here, and then go to the porous at the, as the last, last step to remove it. So this is um, just a video <clears throat> of a medium-sized um, acoustic uh, post-operative CT. So um, now I would come to the end of the lecture. So just summarizing um, how a neurosurgeon learns to drill. There are many, many different steps. So first there are the drill courses. And I, I recommend uh, also my, my residents to visit drill courses because 
you learn a lot of basic stuff, but you also learn a lot of um, um, uh, methods how not to use the drill. So an unintended use, which you cannot perform in the OR because it's the danger for the patient. Um, dissection course, cadaver dissection, if possible in your own hospital, university hospital, that's uh, really, uh, uh, um, uh, that would be the best, but uh, of course not every hospital has got uh, the opportunity and the facilities to, 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 to do cadaver dissection. But there are many uh, dissection courses provided and it's always helpful to, to do anatomy and it's, um, it's a must for neurosurgeon to, to learn the anatomy three, three dimensionally at the cadaver. Um, operating room should be the last um, place where one try to perform anything and uh, use the high speed drill. So, so um, because um, of course it's uh, patient safety and you need to have the skills beforehand. Um, so the targets are sharing expertise and um, that you get comfortable with the high speed drill system. And you also get acquainted with different types of burrs. So I didn't go deep into different types of burrs uh, because uh, Mr. Mauch will, uh, will have this topic and he, he's, uh, uh, he can show you a really a lot of uh, different types uh, for, for many indications, other indications. Um, and also very, very important is that you get comfortable and confident with the drilling procedure and you know, to improve your surgical techniques and also improve the surgical outcome um, by correct handling of the devices. And as I said, um, with cadaver or with, uh, with just dry training, uh, you can try to use uh, the drill in a non-intended way. So, so you just can try what happens, you know? And, and so, so this is also important to know because um, then you're not surprised when these uh, things happen uh, in your OR. Um, so we did, in the past, we did a few uh, drill courses also in Indonesia. Um, it was, it began in 2011 in Surabaya, then in Bandung and, and uh, also in China uh, in, uh, in the year 2011 in uh, Guangzhou, Hangzhou and, uh, and many other different uh, places and 2016 finally in Germany. And it was always a very, very nice course and, uh, and um, very inspiring. And um, the courses were, were organized by, also by the ESCLAV Academy at that time. And so I would really uh, like to thank you for organizing all the fantastic courses uh, in the past. And um, so right now <clears throat> we've got a different setting We've got a webinar and of course, there are many things which, uh, which cannot be um, presented unless you do a live, uh, live dissection uh, into the web. Um, uh, but so this is, uh, this is the, I think uh, the first webinar where uh, we are trying to, um, um, to give a lecture about uh, this very important topic, uh, drilling, high-speed drilling techniques and um, I hope that, um, that some of the contents of my lecture would help you. Of course, it's a very, very, very um, large topic. So I cannot get into every anatomical field, but um, I hope that every one of you have got some idea, depending on your level and stage of training. Um, uh, for for the safe use of uh, of high speed drills um, in your surgery. So thank you very much for listening and telling Makashi Banyak. Thank you very much, Professor Nakamura. Very interesting and excellent lecture. I hope we have learned a lot. And before we proceed to our second speaker, I would like to warm up the discussion by inviting uh, two of our panelists. The first is Dr. Skio Widi Nugroho, mm -hmm. and the second is Dr. Calvin Mack from Hong Kong, to each uh, have uh, to ask one question each in the next five minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nindra. Uh, thank you, Professor Nakamura, for your very nice uh, presentation. I think it's 
and inspire everybody. Um, uh, this 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 drilling system is a uh, uh, yeah we, we we of course we teach our residents we teach our neurosurgeon uh, how to use this this kind of how to perform a very good drilling but uh, we have one principle that I hope you agree that uh, the most important is that when while we use the drill we have to be sure that the drill is still very sharp and this is not a dull one uh, because in, in your situation we, we know that in German uh, the drill must be used in the new condition and sometimes in our country we, we reuse the, the drill so we, we must be sure that the drill must be still very sharp we never used to uh, make a pressure to the bone but we use the sharpness of the of the drill to perform a drilling so uh, we can reduce the, the risk of, uh, of, of injured the, the, the soft tissue. This is what we, we teach our research. And the second is that, uh, how, what, what do you think about if we use the uh, Rosen drill, there is a risk of rolling, right? Rolling, this is the one that you have already teach. So sometimes uh, we differentiate be, between using the uh, Rosen drill and diamond drill. So, in the deeper side, it is safer to use diamond drill because it doesn't have uh, a risk of rolling. While we use the uh, Rosen drill, it have a risk of rolling. So, in the superficial, we use uh, we can still use the the uh, 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 I mean the Rosen drill, but in the deeper side. If it is still very easy, we can use Rosen, but be very careful. But after in the very sensitive area, we use the diamond drill in that. What do you think about about that kind of uh, thinking way of thing? Thank you. Uh, yes, because we have very limited time, I, I limited my question. Thank you. Yes. yes. Um. Thank you very much for your question. Um. So the first uh, with the chop drill, you're completely right. Um. The drill must has to be always sharp and. Um, and that's very important because uh, otherwise you, you I, I think you naturally develop a strong force on, on the drill and you try to get through the bone or whatever. And then it's, it's just dangerous and uh, it can be uncontrollable. And so it, the first thing is to check is the drill sharp or not. And um, so nowadays we've got uh, one, uh, most of the, the parts are one way but we, have, we still have got the reusable um, drills there, um, but it's an, a very important issue. And um, I think the most important is that uh, the strength of force that you apply onto the drill system is completely different. And it is just natural for, for everybody that when, when you've got a dull drill, you, you put on much more force. And then when you slip away, you don't have a control over it. Yes, so I completely agree with you. Um, the second, Rosen superficially and diamond burr uh, deep structures. So I think for the beginner, <coughs> for the beginner, it is um, it is a safe and uh, an important instruction. Um, I would not dogmatically or categorically say, okay, you are not allowed in any way to use the Rosen drill at the skull base. But I, I would say it's, it really depends on the, uh, on the experience of the surgeon. Yes. So as we know, um, when you're very, very, uh, when you're a very highly sophisticated skull base surgeon who is drilling every day in the patron's bone, then yes. um, you, would, you would not use the diamond drill because it just yes. takes too much time. Yes. <laughs> so yes. you yes. first, Yes, you first yes. use the Rosen yes, yes. drill until you get into an area where you are yourself comfortable yes. uh, with the distance to critical structures. Yes. So, and this distance to critical structures, I think, is very different from experience to experience. Yes. So, yes. I would say rather say um, so, so. For the first step, of course, it's it's much uh, safer to to use uh, Rosen superficially and diamond deep. But for the advanced stage, um, every surgeon needs to know the limits for himself. So I personally, for example, 
at the internal auditory canal, I always begin with the rosin. Mm -hmm. um, but just because because I, it's a, a little bit quicker for me to to get in, uh, get at the, at the stage where I see the dura of the internal auditory canal, and then I switch to a diamond, and then um, then do the fine work. Okay. Um, but of course, of course, for the, for the first time, I I used the diamond drill right at the first step because I was I was worrying and I was I was really cautious, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Nakamura, for the answer. And one question from Dr. Calvin Mack. He's from Hong Kong, a colleague. Please, Calvin. Yes, hello. Um, hello, uh, Dr. Nanda, and uh, hello, uh, Dr. Luidi, and um, yeah, uh, Professor. Uh, nice to meet you, um, everyone, again, um, on this uh, virtual um, meeting. I uh, hope really one day we can meet um, again and um, uh, gather around. So, um, but I, I'm a, a skull base surgeon, um, uh, both open and endoscopic. So, uh, just a comment and a, and a question. Uh, well, first of all, your lecture is very informative, and uh, with your vast experience, it's um, excellent. Uh, congratulations uh, to your excellent results as well. Um, I, I want to echo your point that it's very important to, first of all, to have a good um, irrigation to uh, during drilling to uh, lower down the temperature, uh, especially during using the diamond drill. Otherwise, it can cause the damage to the nerves, um, especially, for example, the optic nerve or the facial nerve when, when one is drilling along the fallopian uh, canal. And, um, and also um, it's, um, it's, it's the um, uh, right way that uh, we, we should uh, use the larger uh, diameter per in the beginning um, instead of a small one. Um, uh, otherwise it can uh, really uh, easy for beginners, for trainees to uh, dig deep and then damage the, the uh, structures there. And um, a question to you is that um, for uh, ACP drilling, um, like, for example, for uh, tumors or for um, uh, aneurysm clipping, do you prefer um, extradural approach or intradural approach? Um, yes, for aneurysm. Um, so first, um, for example, for paraclinoidal aneurysm, um, I look the the level of the clinoid. Um, compared to the to the aneurysm, so it is very nicely uh, seen on the on the um, on the CTA on the CT angiography, and then um, decide whether I do an extra extra drill part or not. Um, I personally do like ninety to ninety five percent of these manners. I do an intradural um, um, clinoidectomy. Um, that's just for. I think for me, it's more a psychological reason, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I wanna see, I first wanna see the aneurysm where it is intradurally. And then um, I can see how much, I, I, of course, preoperatively, you can, you can imagine how much amount of clinoid you need to drill, but intraoperatively, you can definitely know um, how much you need to drill. And then I, I uh, really do most of the cases intradurally um, despite that your aneurysm is, you know, just next to it, you know, um, because I, I want to, I want to see the amount, I can see the amount intradurally um, more exactly than extradurally, and then expose just uh, the amount um, um, of, um, of the um, carotid artery um, as needed, you know, mm -hmm. and so I, I know that for some surgeons, it's the more uncomfortable way. But for me, it's more uncomfortable to, um, to do an extra rural clinodectomy, do not see the aneurysm, and then, you know, something happens, and, and then, so I'm, it's a very bad feeling for me. And I think technically, it's, it's not in almost, in most of the cases, it's just enough to do a partial clinodectomy in order to clip the uh, paraclinoidal aneurysm. Right. Um, oh. Yes, um, I, I agree as well. Um, for, for actually, I started off um, with uh, extradural uh, drilling uh, for all cases, like for tumors and um, uh, like for some clinoidal meningiomas and uh, for clipping of um, of a uh, uh, or something as well. But then, um, uh, with some experience gaining, I nowadays I do the aneurysm cases. I agree very much that just partial drilling is okay. 
and um, it's uh, not um, really necessary to take a lot of time to do the extra duty frame, although it, it, it can be quite quick uh, and, and under experienced hands, but that's still, I would agree that for um, uh, intradural drilling, it suffices. And um, also for some cases of um, um, uh, tumors, and if I do it with an LSO approach, uh, lateral supraorbital approach, or with a keyhole approach, then uh, intradural drilling would make more sense. Uh, however, for large uh, clonidal meningiomas or medial spinodal rich meningiomas, uh, I would uh, prefer doing the extra dural approach because usually the clinoid is very large and high prostatic. And uh, by drilling extra durally, it can uh, um, uh, do the hemostasis as well and the devascularization. It's just yes, the way right. that I'm doing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So I think um, uh, I think one should keep it in case by case, you know. Um, so I would not agree to say in every case you need always to do an extra drill clinoidectomy in order to resect a, you know, clinoidal meningioma or anything like that. Um, because in my view, it's not needed, you know, it's just... Uh, it's just a procedure um, where in, in many cases you just don't need it. And if you, if you do a very fast and, and uh, quick um, extra rural clinodectomy because you've got a lot of experience, uh, then it's, it's okay uh, for the surgeon. But um, I think, so my philosophy is just to do what you need, you know? And so, in, and this is just individually in every tumor, it's different. And, so I completely agree with you. There are uh, very good indications where you right away do the extra dual clinoidectomy because the tumor is, is big and because the clinoid is hypertroph um, and has got a hypertrophy and, and you've got much more space when you do that first. And you also devasculate to the tumor, by the way. Um, and then there are, um, you know, like tumors like tuberculum cell and meningiomas, which goes into the optic canal, but you don't, need to drill the clinoid or when you see that you need to do it, you can do it intraorally. So just decide individual and also in, you can decide intraoperatively if you need, need that or not. All right, thank, thank you. you. This is just a warm up. Don't worry, we can continue okay. the discussion <laughs> later because uh, we have a second speaker. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Michael Mao, the Senior Product Manager, Power Systems. B. Brown Esculap AG from Germany. He will talk about the drilling systems that the B. Brown Esculap AG ha has. And the time is yours, Michael. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Um, just a second. I will share my screen with you. Okay. All right, so I hope everybody can see my screen. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, welcome uh, to the session, the safe use of a high-speed drill. Now, Esculap develops and produces power systems since already more than 100 years. And in the field of high-speed, we are active since about 25 years. Now, our actual system is the E-Line 4, and this is the one which I used here for my demonstrations. So most of the information are, are very general. They are valid for older motor systems of S-Club as well, but also of systems for, for other manufacturers. So it's not somehow fixed to our actual ELAN 4 system. Yeah. And yes, as we heard this, as we are unfortunately, unfortunately not able to do a drill course uh, directly in Indonesia. So I want to give you some information about the safe use of, uh, of a drill by means of a presentation and um, also a few video clips. Now, after Nak Professor Nakamura has already uh, highlighted more or less the, the clinical aspects, so I will focus a bit more on, on the technical issues so from, the, from the view of the, the power systems technique. Yeah. And maybe uh, afterwards in the, um, in the discussion, we can bring the two things then together. Now, I would like to start with some ergonomic issues. So the, the use of the shortest possible handpiece provides the best ergonomics and therefore also an increased safety. Yeah. So of course you don't need every available handpiece length, but you should make sure that um, you pick always the most suitable from your set. We've seen many people who just like to use a, a very long handpiece because they believe it's, it's the most universal one. 
Well, but this can lead to a working situation with, with rather bad ergonomics uh, by holding the handpiece very, very distally at the thin shaft. And in, in this case, the motor does not sit well in your hand and the long handpiece creates a high lever force, which requires then from you uh, an unnecessarily strong grip. Um, well, sometimes there are very um, cost-effective uh, solutions. For example, with the S-Club E-Line 4, you can convert the craniotome into a short handpiece just by means of a little holding sleeve. Therefore, this handpiece can be used for all kinds of superficial works. And so there's no need for any additional short handpiece. So just need to try to get here a laser pointer. So that's what I mean. This here is a quite, quite inexpensive holding sleeve, which you can put onto your um, craniotome and uh, that way you also have um, especially really very short handpiece for all the superficial works and um, so you don't have to go for, for another handpiece. Okay, maybe everybody should go on mute. Yeah, thank you. Now, <clears throat> Coming to the craniotome, and um, here I want to highlight that the craniotome is a micro instrument and therefore it should be treated accordingly. Yeah? So don't hold it like a hammer. Yeah? Um, and because due to the, the, the long lever, you can apply a very high force and this force here is then transferred to the dura guard. Yeah? And just by tilting the, the craniotome, as you see here, just a, a little bit, the, the dura guard can be squeezed inside the cutting gap here and then the craniotome cannot advance anymore. So it does not move, move forward. And so you get, you get stuck. Yeah. And then there's of course also the risk that the dura, bar, dura guard gets bent. Yeah. So in, in that case, it will of course also, also not move smoothly, smoothly through the cutting gap. And there's also an increased risk for dura injuries. So if you have any dura guards like this, check them before you use, you use them. So don't, don't use this kind of, of bent dura guards because here, you leave a little lamella and then you get stuck. And in, in, in that case, when the dura guard is um, bent that way, it's not straight behind the burr. You will not be able to move smoothly through the, through the cutting gap. Yeah. So therefore, always hold the craniotome like a pen. So let, let the motor do the work. You have a high powerful motor. So the motor does the work and you just guide the, the craniotome through the bone. So you are just the driver. Further, uh, one thing is um, the, the, longer the longer the dura guard, the more difficult it is to handle. So therefore you should not use just the, the largest or the longest dura guard as a standard, which some people like because they think they can do everything with it. So it's just advisable always to use the standard or the, the middle size wherever possible. And that will be sufficient in most cases and, and the handling is um, much easier. Now coming to the actual, to, to the effects of high speed. Yeah? Um, that's, we heard that already. So high speed, of course, with a higher speed, you have a higher dissection rate and therefore you can do your work much quicker. But it's also a kind of pressure-free working because um, the speed um, takes off more in the same time. So you don't have to press that much. And this of course allows you to uh, increase your precision because you don't have to press. And also increased safety because pressing means that you can slip off and um, that can lead to a, a dangerous situation. Yeah. Of course, you also have a higher working comfort and less fatigue um, because it's faster and you don't need to press that much. And therefore it's all, uh, important always use the full speed to obtain the advantages of high speed. Yeah. If you just work with half speed, you don't have this, um, this positive effects of high speed. Therefore always use the, the full speed. Now, high speed reduces this so-called wheel effect, which um, Professor no Nakamura already has mentioned. Yeah? So this, this wheel effect means, as you, as you see here, that the burr tends to run away into the direction it is moving. Yeah? Now, a, a cutting burr, this means a burr with, with cutting fluids, so it's such a rosen burr and not a diamond burr. Yeah? It does only cut into one direction, yeah? so in, in the right direction or forward or, or, or you also call it clockwise direction. So in this case, the bird tends to move to the right, of course. And um, this wheel effect is reduced by higher speed. Yeah? However, it's never completely eliminated, but that's also a reason 
why you always should work with, with full speed because this wheel effect somehow gets at least uh, reduced. Yeah. Now, and due to this wheel effect, you have to be especially careful when you are working left of critical structures because if the burr moves uncontrolled, then it will move towards the right. Yeah. And when working close to sensitive structures, it is anyway recommendable, we discussed this before already, to use a diamond burr, yeah? because the diamond burr is, is much safer, but I will say something more to the diamond burr later on. Now, the diamond burr also can be used in the reverse mode. So in, in this case, the burr would then, if you go into the reverse mode, rather uh, move to the left. So if you work left of critical structures, you can think about putting the diamond burr into reverse. So if it hooks in, it runs into the other direction. But there is also another question, um, which is, does the, the working direction make a difference? So, and I have to say, indeed it does. Working uh, against the rotation of the burr can create more chattering. This means if the burr is turning into that direction and you work into that direction, so from uh, right to left, then uh, you can create more chattering than if you move with the burr rotation, meaning from left to right. Uh, so by the way, I don't know if everybody knows this word chattering. So chattering is means when the burr is jumping uncontrolled, sometimes it's not even a big jump, it's these little small jumps and that's that's what we call chattering. Yeah. So, and therefore due to this, this, this chattering, if you, if you work from right to left, some surgeons te uh, teach to drill um, with the rotation. So from, from left to right to, to minimize this uncontrolled jumping. Now, in, in my view or in our view, this bears also certain risks, because if you work from right to left, then your index finger is already supporting the handpiece. Yeah? Now, if the burr hooks in and tries to move to the right, the index finger is already under tension and is somehow prepared to support the burr or support the handpiece against this movement. Yeah? Um, so what all, everything I told you is not uh, is only valid, of course, for right-handed people. So for for left-handed, it's then uh, the opposite situation. Now, here you can see this in the video. If you don't hold the, hold, hold the burst stably, we chop the right. As you've seen in the, uh, above, the, the burr was not hold um, stable, so or the handpiece, so it was just running away to the right. Now, if you go here from from right to left, um, you create this little chattering, which could maybe hear a bit, but you also see it here at the rougher surface and the the, the, the bone you see here. If you go from from left to right, and then you have less chattering on also a, a smoother surface, but. How much chattering and jumping is, is created by drilling against the burr rotation also depends on the burr size and the, the design of the individual burr. So consequently, the burr behavior will not always be the same, and especially if you use different burr diameters or if you compare um, systems or burrs from different manufacturers. It also depends how much bone you try to resect with each movement. So if you re resect smaller amounts, then the chattering will be less an issue. If you push the burr with more force into the bone, then, then the chattering will be stronger. So this is why we recommend to get familiar with your drill and first to do some practice, maybe at some specimen, animal bone, or even a piece of wood. Yeah? So find out which working uh, way is the best and the safest for you in the different working situations. Then high speed also has a negative effect, which was already mentioned. Of course, higher speed creates more heat and therefore the cooling and irrigation is extremely important. And I think Professor Nakamura has underlined this already. <clears throat> and um, the, the thing is of course, first that you create direct heat at the bone by drilling. Yeah? That's this direct heat you get into the bone. But then if you have a hot burr, you can also discuss destroy delicate structures if by accident, even with a standing burr, you touch any kind of small vessels or, or, or nerves. So always irrigate sufficiently. Then the burr diameter has also been, has also been mentioned uh, before. So uh, it is an important parameter that should not be underestimated. 
Well, on, on the one side, larger birds, they, they rather tend to chatter and, and jump. And on the other side, um, the small birds rather dive into the bone, as you've seen um, on the uh, pictures and um, uh, videos already, um, and create then a notch or a groove. Yeah. So if you want to create a smooth and even surface, like for example, um, when you clean the intervertebral disc space, then a slightly larger bird really can make uh, the difference. So let's see this in the following example. We have here a four millimeter burr. Here you see that this plunges into the bone. Yeah. And, and it creates here a notch. And after this, it's difficult to recreate an even surface. Now, if you take a burr which is just one millimeter larger, so here it's a five millimeter burr, yeah, um, you will be able to do this um, much better. So you just put it with one millimeter more. It, it is no problem to make that move still face. Now, in, in this special case, we even have used a soft cut burr. Yeah, which is not that aggressive, and then you can do uh, it even better. So we always make sure you know what kind of, of burrs are available. And sometimes it's maybe not the most aggressive, but these kind of soft cut burrs which are available, which can do the, the job in a better way. So then um, I would like to uh, present the, cut, uh, the cutting uh, characteristics of Rosenberg in the next little video, but then it's, not so easy to bring everything to the screen. Yeah, um, in, in a workshop, you can feel it. Um, here, you sometimes maybe hear the chattering, but it's, it's difficult to, to see it. So you, you have maybe to listen carefully. So Rosenbergs in general are optimized for lateral cutting, yeah? and they have a certain tendency to chatter if you drill frontally into the bone, um, as you can see it here. So you hear that bad noise, so that's dangerous, and therefore you should rather work in an angle of 45 to 90 degrees. Therefore, it's much smoother. And by appealing motion, as you have seen it here, you should make the hole always slightly larger than the bird diameter. So, this is, if the diameter is always a bit bigger than the bird diameter, this avoids that the cutting fluids get in contact with the bone on the full circumference at the same time. But this creates Now, here you see the use of a, a soft cut Rosenberg. And um, these soft cut Rosenbergs can be a, a, a quite interesting alternative. Now, for Esculap or for Elan Freud, it's the soft cut. Some other um, companies call it different. But this burr is slightly less aggressive. But on the other side, it has a, a, a reduced shattering behavior, so it can be a, a very helpful tool. And um, after this, we will also see here um, the twin cut burr. This is also an interesting alternative. This twin, twin cut burr looks a bit scary. It only has two cutting fluids, but it allows a very controlled bone resection at uh, nearly no, no shattering at all. So I was just told not to talk while the, the video is running because there are some interferences and the burr makes too much noise. So just want to um, repeat what I wanted to say. So here um, it is really go in rather in a 45 uh, degree angle and do this, this peeling motion so that the burr, um, the, the whole di the diameter of the hole is a bit bigger than the burr. Otherwise the burr gets in, in contact with the, um, the, the, all the cutting fluids get in contact with the bone on the full circumference, and then you create a dangerous cutting. And here we have the two examples how it works. If you take, for example, a soft cut burr, which is a bit more gentle, 
or this special twin coupler, which has no chattering and um, more or less no chattering and is, is extremely um, good to handle as a very uh, high performance. Now the diamond burrs, um, diamond burrs are the safety burr or are the safety burrs. Um, the issue is that the diamonds, they do not grip tissue like the cutting fluids of the other burrs would do. So they can push soft tissue away as long as it can be weighed. And, and therefore they cut principally um, first heart um, bone, but, but not soft tissue. Now, I think most of you know the classic demonstration is here, the peeling of the raw egg. And I want to encourage you to do this training in case you have not done it yet, just get some eggs and, and do that training. It is highly effective. And um, I want to ask you also to try some of the coarse diamond burrs. Now, coarse diamond burrs are the ones uh, which have um, larger diamonds on. Um, and they are not as dangerous as some of you might believe. They, they look a bit scary because also they have large diamonds, but they are still quite safe. And sometimes they are just more effective than um, the, the classic diamond burrs. So the diamond burrs, they do not really cut, you know, they, they rather dissect the bone by, by grinding. Yeah? And this is the reason why they uh, create um, so much more heat than, than fluted burrs. And um, there is a little impression um, of how this looks under a, a high speed camera. Yeah, so the burr here worked at 80,000 RPM. And I want to highlight this is more than 1,300 revolutions per second. Yeah, I, I can't imagine this really, but um, this is extremely fast. So 1,300 revolutions per second, that's, that's tough. And I think this video illustrates very nicely this grinding process. And therefore you can very well maybe imagine how this, this heat development uh, happens, yeah. And it's this, um, yeah, this, the reason, uh, or the, the, the strong heat development is the reason that diamond burrs should not be used for the resection of large bone areas. Yeah? If you have large bone ar areas where you are uh, still safe in the beginning, maybe they should be resected with a cutting burr first. Only once you get close to critical structures, then it's indicated um, to, to switch to a diamond burr. Yeah? And these diamond burrs also create more load on, on the handpiece because there's more pressure onto the bearings than compared to a Rosenburg. And this means that you can also de considerably decrease the lifetime of your handpiece if you only work with, with diamond burrs. You know, some people, they are a bit scary. They do everything just with diamond burrs, but that can also be then a disadvantage for your uh, equipment. Now here, the the burr on this picture does not cut anymore. Yeah. It has not been irrigated. <coughs> um, and after a short time, the diamonds got smudged with bone meal. So smudge means that um, the burr is completely covered with bone residues and they stick on the surface. And if you do this even longer, they will burn into the surface if, if you don't irrigate. Yeah. And therefore, the diamonds cannot do their work anymore. The result will be that the surgeon puts more pressure Onto the onto the system and onto onto the drill, and again also more load onto the handpiece, and this also means a faster wear and and defect of the handpiece. So sufficient irrigation is not only safer for the patient, but it also can prolong the the life of your equipment. Yeah. Now and these coarse diamond burrs, so the ones with the larger diamonds, they do not get much that fast. So Therefore, sometimes uh, they can be also advantage to check if you can do um, your work with a, with a large diamond burr. Now, with the Rosen and diamond burrs, you can do already most of your, your work, but keep your eyes open. There are also some other interesting alternatives. Now, in this uh, lecture, I'm not able to, to touch all of them, but I, I want to demonstrate here at least just one. This is the NeuroCutter. And this neurocutter is a very good um, in lateral cutting. So this means here on the side, it is cutting very well. Um, on the front here, it is rather gentle, especially to soft tissue. 
And so this can also be as a, a, a safety feature. Um, I have here uh, an a photo of, of a training, a training uh, situation. And um, this is a quite inexpensive exercise for training, which you can do uh, where you could train a kind of a, a nerve compression um, using this, this burr. <clears throat> then some systems offer additional safety features. For example, here for the E-Line 4, this, this lateral burr guard, which can be clipped onto the high-speed hand pieces. It shields the burr and here also a neuro cutter uh, from one side. Well, it's probably not something you, you, you need every day or you use every day, but in select cases, this can increase the safety of drilling in, in, in special situations. Then please also consider that a micro saw sometimes might be able to do the job even better. It's not only about high speed drills. Yeah? Certain areas might be reached better with a saw and uh, with, this, with this minimal stroke, the Elan 4 uh, micro saw blades are quite safe. Yeah? And the, the blades have a thickness of only 3 point, uh, 0 0.3 millimeters. This means very, very little bone loss. And that can be um, a big advantage, especially in reconstructive uh, surgery. And also same situation with the burst check, all the available saw blades. So depending on the approach or the anat anatomical situation, different ones can be indicated. For example, if you have to, to dive into the bone with your cut, then it's a big advantage if you have the rounded part in the area of the, of the, of the serration of the teeth. If you have to um, cut bone underneath soft tissue, then you better have a blade which has a flat rounding here and in, in that area. Or if the stroke goes towards, if, towards soft tissue, well, for example, in uh, laminotomies, you can also choose a, a saw blade which has this uh, rounded uh, tip and that's probably then the, the, the safest saw blade in such a, a situation. <clears throat> Now, here are some tips uh, how you in can increase the lifetime of, of your burrs. So at least during one operation, um, always use sufficient irrigation. So we heard that the burr stays longer sharp. It does not um, get smudged with, with bone meal. Don't use any metal brushes. Um, we know them from the diatomy forceps. Some people like to use them to, use, uh, to, to clean the burrs uh, intraoperatively. Don't do that. And please also avoid contact with instruments because uh, with contact to other metal, the burrs will get blunt uh, very quickly. And of course, you also create a lot of metal abrasion, which you don't want to have in your OR situs. Yeah. And um, as Dr. Vidi already mentioned, the situation of the reuse of the burrs, well, we have this situation not only in Indonesia, also Germany or Japan are very conservative countries and we have a lot of hospitals which reuse the burrs. So all this, this single use philosophy, which we rather know from, from the US is not really the case also in Germany and in other um, markets like uh, in, in Japan. So now if you reuse the burrs, how, uh, what should you take care of? Well, first of all, the disposal should be done by the surgeon. You know, these people who, who clean the burrs for you, they, they cannot judge if the burrs are still good for re reuse. They can only sort out the real bad parts. Yeah, So it, it should be up to, to you. You are the one who feel the, the burr in the, in the case or in the operation. So if it's not good even anymore, then please, it's up to you, exchange the burr. And then um, very important or mandatory is the protection of cutting edges. You see, S Club, for example, has some uh, nice holders where the cutting edges of the high speed burrs or skull perforators are, um, are um, protected. They are not that expensive and they will pay off really quickly because um, they make much more out, more of, out of your burrs. And here I want to show you an example of a skull perforator, which we got from a customer as a complaint because it was um, blunt very, very fast. Yeah. But this here is not blunt due to wear and tear, which you can see here from all these damages. Yeah? So it, it is damaged and this kind of damage, they happen in the, in the reprocessing process or during tra transport and so on. Yeah? 
So if you protect the, the cutting edges just by a special holder like this, you will make much more out of your tools and they will um, live much, much longer. I know that that's not your task, but in the end, it's your pain. And if you have a bit of look onto that and you motivate your people to take care of these things, that will be, um, um, yeah, at least also positive for, for your work. Well, and I hope I was able to give you some useful insights into the safe use of birth. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the discussion in case there are some, some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for sharing your expertise in technology of drilling instruments. Now is for the discussion, and I invite all the panelists to open and start their videos, and please raise their hands so, so I can see who will ask the questions. Could you unshare the, the, okay, that's right. So I would invite all the panelists to ask some questions to Professor Nakamura and to Michael Mao. Okay, I will start with, uh, I saw Dr. Selfie raising her hand. Uh, please, Dr. Selfie. Oh, thank you very much for, um for the invitation, Dr. Nanda. And um, thank you very much, first of all, to Professor Nakamura. It's so good to see you again. So good to see you safe and healthy there. Uh, it's a very nice lecture and I do learn a lot from this session. Um, I do have a couple of questions. My first question is, um, it's quite a rare complication, but when you are doing the anterior um, one could encounter or open accidentally the sphenoid sinus and can cause post-operative CSF leak. Do you have any um, standard enclosure when you are doing anterior craniodectomy versus the one that you are not doing the anterior craniodectomy? That would be my first question. And um, my second question would be, um, thank you iSchoolUp for keep developing this uh, sophisticated instrument that um, hopefully can make our life a little bit easier in the OR. And Professor Nakamura, I have never used the uh, LN4 in the OR um, settings. It's only trying in the lab. In your experience, how different it is using it, the LN4, compared to the previous um, generation of high school up drill? Yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, um, thank you very much for your question. And nice to see you again, Selfie. Um, been a few years. Um, so first, um, concerning your first question, opening the um, sphenoid sinus, it sometimes happens uh, when you drill medially, um, but it's it more uh, happens when you drill medially. Um, so uh, when you're opening the op uh, the optic canal, and uh, but also of course uh, from the clinoid, but usually from for us, it's no problem because the opening is not that large. Uh, when you open it, um, so you you need to notice, of course. So that is, I think, the first step. You really need to notice and think about closing it again um, after um, after finishing the procedure. And we just almost always do a soft closure. So we use. Um, 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 a fibrin coated uh, sponge, which is called um, taco seal. And so uh, we coat it and, um, and um, seal it with, uh, with this. And, um, and underneath, sometimes we just uh, put on a little bit of gallia and then uh, um, close it with, uh, with, a, with a fibrin uh, glue coated um, sponge. And so, and then, then um, that is usually enough. Um, in some cases, we put in uh, just a small piece of muscle uh, on top of it, just to put a, uh, just to get a more pressure on the on the ceiling. But uh, that's that's it, and we really never had a big problem uh, with uh, CSF fistula afterwards. So that um, to the first uh, question, and the second question is um, Elan four. Um, so it is 
it is really um, a nice system. And um, I got to, I had the pleasure when I was in Hanover until 2016, I was uh, vice chairman there and had the, got the, um, I got the order to, 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 um, to renew our old system. And uh, when I left, when I was about to leave the hospital in Hanover to come to Cologne, then a large um, uh, set of Elan 4K. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was really unhappy, but we have Elan 4 in, in, my, uh, in my hospital in Cologne also. And uh, I, I know I got used to work with it a long time. And so first of all, it's very silent. It's, it's really a, a high, really high speed, but it's, it's really silent. And um, so, so, uh, so it's, much, it's really no comparison to the, to the former um, system. And um, so we have got uh, the different types of grips are more comfortable. So they are, they are more um, adapted to the surgeon's hand, I would, I would say. So, um, of course, you have got uh, many different uh, length of the, the drilling systems, and um, and one thing which is very um, good for not not only for the surgeons but for the nurses is that um, the changing of the tip is very simple. So um, you've got a very um, short drill which you can change. Um, just at the tip of the of the drill, and um, and the changing of the grip and the changing of the length uh, of the, between the drills is very straightforward. So um, our nurses like it very much, you know, and I think it, that's also very important for the surgeon that the nurses um, uh, right away know how to change and uh, keep up with the system and and put the right uh, give you the right uh, drill um, for you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Okay, Dr. Selfie, you're welcome. And any other questions from the panelists? Yes, Dr. Roland, I can see your hand raising. Dr. Roland from Bandung, how are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm fine, Dr. Nanda, and how are you? Fine. Thank you, Dr. Nanda, Dr. Stewidi, and uh, all the committee uh, for the nice uh, webinar this, uh, this uh, Saturday night. And Hello, Dr. Nakamura. I hope you still remember me back yes. 2012. <laughs> yes. Nice to see you again. How are you? Oh, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I have uh, two questions for you and uh, one question to, to Mr. Uh, Mausch. Uh, the first question, uh, Dr. Nakamura, uh, continuous uh, question about uh, Dr. Kaufman before. If you do something, uh, the case of uh, drilling is between intradural and extradural anterior clinectomy, do you already have a plan before the surgery or you can change the plan during the surgery depend on the case? In, in such a case of uh, not absolute, like uh, drilling in uh, aneurysm, like uh, clinical uh, uh, aneurysm. Just like uh, maybe you found you, you already uh, have a plan drilling this uh, extradurally and then you switch the decision into uh, intradural. That's the first the first question. And then the second question is uh, in your lecture you saw very nicely, very very excellent about the drilling in the retrosigmoid of uh, vestibular sonoma, right? Uh, I know uh, that you always most most your patient you do it the uh, semi sitting position right, but uh, here in our institution we 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 rarely doing this the semi sitting position about the drilling the 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 MI. So is, is there any differences the drilling the tubing and line to expose the uh, intracanaliculi between the semi sitting position and then. Uh, the, the supine position as well. Is there any any differences to drill that one? So there's there's the two questions, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nakamura. And then maybe the last uh, the last question is to Dr. Uh, Mr. Mouch later maybe. So uh, thank you very much for your question, Roland. And very nice to see you again after eight years, I think. <laughs> it's a yeah, very eight years, eight long years. time. 
Yes. Um, so um, the first with the switching from intra to extra rule or, or extra rule to intra rule uh, clinodectomy. So I think, um, I think it's a <clears throat> situation which uh, depends on your strategy and also for, from the pathology and uh, intraoperative um, situation. Of course, um, of course, there, there are uh, large tumors or any other, you know, paracellular uh, lesions and uh, paraclinoidal lesions where you can right away start with the anter anteroclinoidal uh, drilling extradurally and keep with it and then attack uh, the, the, um, the target lesion. But um, you can also switch, so you can do hybrid, you know, uh, and I do it sometimes. And that's an intraoperative decision. So um, hybrid means um, you start with an extra draw, and then um, and then if you need to have intra draw site for any reason, then just open the dura in a standard fashion how you you would do it to attack the target lesion, and then switch, and then uh, you can you can uh, flip the dura so that uh, that you just see both, you know. So, uh, so that's kind of a hybrid, uh, you know, approach. And um, so I think it depends on the lesion itself. Um, it's, I never really had a case where, uh, where I first drilled intradurally and then um, needed to extend much, much more, but that's because, uh, because of the preoperative strategy or the preoperative decision and the, the um, um, where you see the just only the indication for intradural clinodectomy, and that's enough for very very large lesions and very complicated cases uh, where you where you start extradurally, and uh, where there sometimes you need just uh, just a different view from intradural, then you can switch, and I think it's it's easily done because. Uh, because uh, you just uh, need to additionally open the, um, the drill in a standard way and then um, continue also the drilling intradurally. So, so I think it's much dependent on the pathology and also the intraoperative situation there. Yeah. And then what, um, what, are, what the case of the pathology, you do the hybrid one? Oh, that's in, for example, in very large uh, meningiomas, uh, where you definitely know you need anyway op to open very widely the optic canal in order to see completely oh. the optic canal. And also you anyway need to know, uh, you already know where the clinoid needs to be extensively drilled. Then um, I start with, uh, with the extra, extra drill drilling and then um, uh, have got no problem. So first, uh, first uh, just, uh, just with the extra drill part, you don't have any uh, problem with the tumor itself, and and then um, you can get much more space. And also, um, if you if you got the, some fetus there, um, additionally you got uh, less bleeding, so that's uh, that's much more comfortable. But in medium-sized ones um, or very small tumors, which just um, just compress the optic nerve, are but do not have very 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 large extension into the um, uh, intracanalicularly into the optic canal. Um, I don't think that uh, you 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 really need to, to start with extra drill. Just uh, just keep on removing the tumor and then and then um, deal with the optic canal and and anterior afterwards intra -drill. Um the, And your second question: semi sitting and um, lateral or or um, uh, prone position um, um, for the approach. Um, you know that um, that we did we did a, we do a lot semi sitting and we did a lot semi sitting in in, in Hanover, and um, that's the way how I, uh, how I learned acoustic neuronal surgery and also uh, retrosigmoid approaches. Um, but right now in our hospital in Cologne. Um, we right now uh, more do um, a lateral or park bench uh, positioning. So it's um, it's um, just just because uh, the setting of you know the whole operative setting, including anesthesia for semi sitting, is very sophisticated, and it really needs some some time to have a large routine in there. 
So we are right now in the process here, right now for speaking for Cologne um, to, um, to get more and more semi-sitting surgery there, but it's just not, the, just not only the surgeon's problem, but the neuroanesthesia problem. And so it's very high sophisticated anesthesia. So you need really a team which knows what to do in every step from opening the skin until closure of the skin. And uh, so, so uh, just for, for the actual situation, um, uh, we also do uh, retrosigmoid um, surgery in, in the uh, lateral uh, positioning. The difference, I think there's a very big difference. So first is the, in semi, the, the advantage of semi-sitting positioning intradurally is that the operative field is very clean because you have less bleeding, just being, because you have less venous pressure and um, you right away see that, uh, that, um, that uh, you can keep the operative field very, very um, uh, um, clean and have got always a, a nice overview. And the second advantage, which is a very large advantage, I think, is um, you have, the, you have um, the anatomy in the up and down just the regular way. So um, that's easier, but of course, as a surgeon, you also need to be able to adapt. So to see um, uh, vertically or in any other ways, but um, the surgeon has got two hands to do preparation. And uh, when you have got an assistant who is, um, who is irrigating from the side, you, ju you just don't need any bipolar during the surgery. And so I think this is one issue, um, and I can remember really very nicely where Professor Sami at that time said, um, for semi-sitting, the use of bipolar is very dangerous, and if you have less opportunity, less um, situations where you need to really use, use the bipolar for a tumor dissection, it's better. And I think it's it's really true because uh, because um, because uh, you only needs bipolar just for uh, at the end of um, surgery where you uh, need to stop bleeding but uh, during the surgery with irrigation you can you can see the anatomical structures very nicely so this is um, i think these are two main um, advantages the disadvantage is of course first air embolism so you need a team Beginning from the resident who opens the skull and doing the, um, the approach, you really need a team who knows what to do when you open a vein, when you open a sigmoid sinus, or when you've got um, from the emissary vein um, 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 air embolism, that uh, the person knows what to do and what, to, what kind of instructions uh, he needs to give uh, the anesthesiology team. And that is really crucial. I think that's one of the most important uh, things to um, to instruct uh, the team. Otherwise, there are situations where you do not see the air embolism. Um, you oversee it because the emissary vein is open and there is um, um, air embolism, and you don't know the site. You cannot close the emissary vein, and so on. And um, um, so there are many, many ways where you, you can get in, in situations where you need to even stop the surgery. So. I, um, and that would be a pity you, when you when you're just before, just in front of the tumor or not even at the tumor and you need to stop the surgery. Um, so so there are uh, pros and cons, and um, I think in the uh, when you do it in a different way um, uh, in a in a prone position or in a lateral position, uh, you you always have more bleeding, of course, uh, during surgery. And um, most of the time, you are the one who is uh, holding the, uh, the suction tip and, uh, and uh, do a one-hand preparation. It's very difficult to instruct the assistant to, uh, to do suction during vestibular schwannoma surgery. Uh, it's very, very difficult, I think, so yeah, that you can do surgery with both hands. Um, so I think the, these, are the, these are one of the main, um, the main uh, reasons. A second or the last one, which I would like to mention is um, semi-sitting can be quite exhausting for the surgeon, just, just for the hands and arms. So even if you have armrest uh, or 
a table, an annual table, uh, you will feel, I think, after a few hours, or uh, you will feel your arms and hands and your and your neck. <laughs> and so, so that's one thing where everyone needs to be comfortable with that. How about the drilling experience between uh, pro uh, lateral position and is just the same about the drilling the meters acoustic internal? Um, of course, the the drilling. So you. Uh, the holding position is of course different. And um, for semi-sitting, you really need to check whether your hands are resting uh, 100%. And, um, and um, in order not to get tired and in order not to get, uh, get uh, to slip away. But um, for the drilling itself, I think the view is much nicer in a semi-sitting because uh, because of the um, the irrigation from the system to where you irrigate downwards and you right away always see the internal auditory canal. And um, so that can be a little bit tricky in other positions, you know, where you drill and you get the bone chips uh, somewhere else and uh, and um, with the irrigation, you, you do not always get a really clear vision. Don't you think the, the perspective of the anatomy of the bone is different between the lateral and yeah, yeah, yeah. no the um, just the view is of course uh, rotated or or uh, down under and yeah. I think for down under so when you when you have got the complete opposite mm -hmm. then I think uh, the key point is that you need to keep yourself more cordially inferiorly you know because. Uh, when you do it and when you open the skull in prone position, uh, the opening itself is sometimes too high. Yeah. So the retrosic, you know, yeah. and um, because uh, because it's just um, more the natural way to look downwards than to look upwards, you know. And so I think uh, with the craniotomy, and that's something what I um, I uh, observed in my residents when they open open. Um, um, retrosic in, in, in prone position, they get with the craniotomy a little bit too high always. Mm. And I always need to say for vestibular or where too much, where you need to go to the CPA, it's better to be angled, to, to get the approach a little bit angled from inferiorly. Because first of all, you open the door, you will release CSF. The release of CSF is much easier when you do it just in front of the lower cranial nerves. So you get from inferiorly. You know, and yeah. so that's one thing uh, where uh, where or the, where you need to uh, keep that in mind, and also for drilling of the uh, auditory canal, um, you get a little bit. You tend to be a little bit uh, higher superiorly than when you do it uh, semi sitting. But in this case, it's usually not a problem because supramatally you don't have any really dangerous structures in the bone. Yeah. So, yeah. It's much better to do then that than to to drill inferiorly and open the jugular bulb or anything. Yeah, jugular bulb. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Nakamura. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Hope to see you soon in the future. Yes, I hope to see you again. Thank you. All right, Dr. Roman. Yeah, I have one question to Mr. Mouth. Yeah, please. I may. Yes. Okay, Mr. Mouth. Uh, I have a one question for you. Uh, are you you uh, hear my voice? I hear you, yeah, fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, we just uh you know our hospital just arrived uh, the Elan that they just said before, but we, we, we don't use it before it's still uh, just arrived in our hospital. And you always mention about the so many different types of the the burr, right? Yeah. I, I don't know which is we have uh, all of that type of the burr. But do you think if we use the 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 bore is not uh, you know specifically for the bone or the the use of the the bore is it okay for the elan? Uh, I'm not sure if I got the question right. For for, for the <laughs> elan four, right? So many type of the bore. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. We just arrived the elan in our hospital here. But I don't know. We we got uh, all all type of the the burr. Okay. Yeah. If you use only what uh, just rosen, 
for all type of the bone. Is that okay for the ELAN4? Yeah, of course. Well, it, you can you can do most of the work if you only have a rosin, and of course you should also have some diamond burrs. If you get close to critical structures for the safety, you should have some diamond burrs. But on the other side, you should of course have some some craniotomy burrs and probably some some twist drills to if you have to do some tack up holes. But in general, with these four types of burrs, you can do everything. But there are sometimes burrs which do the job even better, and they they don't cost more than the others probably. So it's always good to have a look what is available for the different systems and what would maybe help you to do your job better. So um, have have a look on what they uh, what, what you actually got and um, what is available and. Um, uh, Sometimes you, you never know who has chosen now the selection of what you got. Maybe that's not the best which is available for your um, your work. Or I hope, of course, that somebody yeah. was taking care of that really the right way. But have a look to it. But with with these four build types which I mentioned, you can do you can do actually more or less everything. But sometimes uh, on the skull, especially with um, rosin, diamond, craniotomy cutter, and um, uh, twist drill, you, you can do more or less everything. Uh, if it's more if you go to the spine that you should have some barrel burrs or um, some other different kind of geometries. I mean, it doesn't make a motor uh, broken faster. No, uh, what what I just meant is, um, you know, if if people work a lot only with fine diamond burrs, and uh, mm. if you have to take uh, if you take away a lot of bone um, just with a diamond burr, and then you don't irrigate well, then this means you have to push a lot of pressure onto the on, onto the burr. To, to remove the bone. And this is, of course, not good for any kind of system, not for the Elan 4, not for our older system, and also not for systems of, of other manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not very effective. So that was the idea. So if you take off a lot of bone, large bone areas, um, then, then you should go for a cutting burr like a Rosen, and only to the end, then switch over to, um, to a diamond burr when, when it's about the safety. OK. All right. Um, before I read some questions from the audience, Professor Nakamura, we have uh, more than 170 uh, participants right now. Um, I would like to invite another panelist for some questions. Uh, Dr. Dani Kur. Yeah, I saw his hand. Please, Dr. Dani. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Uh, First, I like to congratulate the committee for this nice uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stiawidi, Dr. Renindra, and Dr. Ande. And uh, thank you for Professor Nakamura for your nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask just a simple question because of the time. Uh, how is to approach, how is uh, your strategy to approach uh, specific structure, uh, such as like a uh, nerve or vessel, or a special structure like uh, a semicircular canal. This is just the, my question. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the question. And um, when I got it right, you mean? Um, when uh, how to approach you know nerves or vessels um, in target regions or like uh, the pituitous bone or do you, do you mean any oh. other anatomy? I'm sorry, uh, maybe I'm not uh, too specific. Uh, how to approach uh, the structure behind the bone, like such as a nerve behind the bone or the vessel behind the bone, how to drill it uh, the safety way. How is your strategy? Ah, okay, okay, all right. Okay, so um, that's an yes, that's an interesting question, general interesting question. I think it depends on the uh, on really on the um, anatomy. Um, so I think the strategy, of course, you've got different uh, scenarios uh, for approaching an, um, a structure, a target structure. So let's say, let's say for example for a vestibular schwannoma where I showed you the intracanalicular um, tumor, which is in the petrous bone and, um, and in the in internal auditory canal. Um, the target, I think, is 
it's much easier, easier, of course, anatomically to locate because you see the seventh and the eighth nerve, you see the extension. And the only thing that one needs to know is what is just in the petrous bone next to it, um, superiorly, inferiorly, and laterally. So, which means anatomy. And I think um, always looking at the landmarks, of course, that's essential. So, which means uh, first, the landmark of the striped dura inferiority to the to the internal auditory canal, where the our Tübingen uh, University of Tübingen colleagues uh, call it the Tübingen line. Uh, that's one very nice landmark to see how far inferiorly one can drill. And then the posterior semicircular canal is not possible to see, so one needs to measure it on CT. So when when where I always uh, want to have a, a thin CT scan for this region, just in order to see how far can I go with my drill laterally, not to open the posterior semicircular canal. So when you, and that, that is individually, of course, very, very different because uh, the, internal, the internal auditory canal is widened according to the tumor size and the pneumatization is different in, in the person and the amount of bone between the posterior semicircular canal and the surface of uh, the drilling position is also very different. So um, it's actually better to measure it. And so when I measure like five or six millimeters, I, um, I look at the burr and when I have got a 2.3 millimeter burr, I just hold it there and then I've got an imagination how far away it is. So with the type of the burr that you need, you need to know the size of the burr, of course. But when I put in the, the tip of the diamond burr or whatever, um, uh, finally at the, at the operating site, I just can measure how far can I go laterally. And so with this way, you can, um, you can uh, prevent to open the posterior semicircular canal and um, anything else. And so I think, um, I think the general strategy, so really generally speaking, is, um, is really the location of the visible landmarks of the anatomy, the visible landmarks at the bone, which is very difficult in, uh, in many areas. And then uh, for measuring the distance, um, just use uh, the drills and uh, use the tips of the drills. And then, um, and then you can add and you can, you can have an imagination how far things are away. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, your information. Uh, how you approach uh, the technique, the technique to drill, Miss? Uh, uh, for example, the nerve, do you attack directly above the nerve or you attack uh, the side of the nerve first and then after the side of the nerve exposed, then you attack the, the center of the nerve, the bones, the bone above the nerve, I mean. Oh, okay, okay. Um, no, first I attack um, just, just in a safety zone beneath the nerve and um, and but um, but that depends on the anatomical region, of course, how 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 much space you have actually um, just next to the nerve, and then um, so for nerves like uh, like the optic nerve, I try to first then switch to the diamond burr and then to see um, to to um, drill just next to the dura, uh, next to the optic sheath. And, uh, and then expose from uh, once when, when I see the optic sheath, uh, then uh, go more laterally um, just, to, just to drill away the, uh, the bone above um, the nerve. So the site from where you come from is uh, dependent on the anatomical structures. Uh, and um, so for example, for the, for the optic nerve, um, for the optic nerve, I think when uh, one has got a lot of um, hypertrophic bone, um, it's of course allowed to drill above the nerve, but to keep in mind that um, that you uh, that you at least when when you are um, near the optic nerve sheath, then switch to the diamond burr and then drill um, drill the, the bone around and make it thinner. 
in order to, to get a very, very small, very thin bony shell, which can be uh, removed with the with the dissector or dissection um, dissector or any other fine uh, micro instruments. Um, finally, thank you, Prof Nakamura, for your information. Okay, to Dr. Nanda. Uh, I would like to read uh, some comments and questions from the audience. There is a comment from Alexander Hartman. This was a very good lecture from the important, with important information for a neurosurgically interested neurologist. Congratulations. So that's from a neurologist. And there's a question for you, Professor Nakamura from Alpha Denti Halijo. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Professor. Pardon me for my elementary question. When should you switch to smaller size drill during anterior craniectomy. Okay, I didn't uh, switch on. Okay, so I would, I would first, of course, start uh, with a larger drill, and um, for for the mentioned reasons uh, that um, that first of all you need to you need to um, ablate a broader area of bone, especially at the base of the, of the clinoid. And, um, and um, when, when you start with a very small burr, you just make holes and you, you plunge into, into the optic nerve, or when you go much, much more deeper, you can even plunge into the uh, carotid. And so, so it's uh, just too difficult, but, uh, too too dangerous. But um, I think that's um, uh, that is something which can be um, generally applied. Um, I usually do um, with a larger bur um, um, cortical ablation, and then just make a groove, a broad groove in the clinoid, and then when you see the optic optic strut and other structures, then you need to switch into a very small, small um, um, diamond burr because uh, the structure itself is really, um, is, uh, is very, very thin. And so I think at least at that point, uh, you need to switch. Otherwise uh, you can, uh, you're, you're not getting further with a, with a larger burr. So um, uh, I think one, one part is with the op optic strut and then, um, and then the other part is when, so when you, uh, when you do drilling just uh, next to the optic nerve, uh, it's also the same that uh, the bone that you need to ablate, uh, ablate and the drill is much, uh, gets much thinner and uh, one needs to switch into a small uh, burr. Right, thank you, Professor. And this, there's another question from Echo Prosetio from Manado. Have you an idea how to protect airborne infection in COVID pandemic as we use high-speed drill? Oh, that's that's an interesting question and very uh, actual. So, um, honestly speaking, it's so actual and it's it's a really a problem where. Uh, in our hospital, we didn't really uh, get more deeper into it. Um, so for general protection in our hospital, uh, we use FFP2 and higher masks. When uh, we have patients uh, who are known to be uh, COVID positive, and um, but that depend that is uh, that is uh, more relating into the aerosol uh, you know uh, creation and um, has got more to do with uh, you know the procedure before surgery than during surgery. And so right now it's a it's a little bit of a debate whether um, whether uh, one needs to protect yourself generally during the surgical procedure itself with high-speed drilling in patients who, uh, where the status of COVID infection is not uh, really clear. Um, just talking about how we handle it is uh, in, in our hospital, um, 
we do call, it's obligatory that every patient who gets inpatient and gets surgery uh, needs to have a, a COVID testing. And um, so when the once the, the patients are negatively tested, then uh, the patients are treated like every other patient. So without any special care. Uh, once the patient is tested positive, and then still needs to have surgery, which is uh, admittedly a very rare situation right now. Um, we have uh, the protection which is added for the surgeon is, is the mask, but otherwise uh, we don't have any other additional uh, protection. So also concerning for the, for the uh, drilling uh, procedure. I don't know how, how you deal with it in Indonesia, maybe a little bit more strict, but um, I think that's, that's a matter- uh, Nearly the same, Professor, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Nearly so, the same, um, yeah. yeah. Well, um, Thank I Thank you. Can uh, I, I don't know how to raise my hand, sorry. <laughs> yes, 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 Michael. Uh, it's okay, I, Michael, please. I've seen, I've seen a message from the UK, from the National Health Service, and they um, recommend to do um, during the COVID situation, high speed drilling only with half speed. I don't know exactly what speed, but not, not with full speed. Um, but then it's of course up to you to weigh out what is what is more important or what is more critical. Yeah, of course, sometimes yeah, if yeah. you are close to special structures, then the high speed has a, a, an advantage. Sometimes it's maybe not so important, but that's the thing which I heard at least from, from the United Kingdom. All right, mm -hmm. Michael, thank you. Uh, there is a question also for, for you, Michael, <clears throat> from Dr. Wisnu Wardana in Bali. Regarding high-speed real hand pieces, could you please mention how is the recommended maintenance steps, limitations, including how to safely sterilize these instruments? Okay. Well, um, I, I, can, I can do that really now uh, because I would, it would take me uh, 10 to 15 minutes. But um, the situation is the, um, the, the hand pieces, the instruments, they can be flushed from inside because if any kind of blood or whatever gets in, we have a, pro a procedure to, to flush them from the inside to get them clean. Yeah. Of course, they can be fully sterilized, autoclaved. And um, uh, for the burrows, we also have a validated a special process to, to get them clean, which is first the immersion in an enzymatic cleaner and then the, the cleaning in, in, in ultrasound. And that way you get nearly everything clean and we also have validated the process. Yeah. But I've done some cleaning myself very often with 10 to 15 minutes ultrasound, you get most to the way. It depends if you as a surgeon, you don't irrigate um, uh, with a diamond burr and, and you work tough, then it's getting more difficult to get the stuff clean than if you, um, if you irrigate a lot during working. Have Thank I you, Michael. Yes. Yeah. And Another question from Dimitrios Atanasopoulos. A question to Mr. Mao and the experienced surgeons of the panel, of course, including Prof. Nakamura. <laughs> Which drill shape is preferable for use on the skull base? For example, an anterior corindectomy or for opening the intermeatus, square or cylindric one, or the round drill. Are there recommendations for this? Yeah, well, I think that's a question I would hand over to a, a surgeon. But in general, you know, from my feeling, it, it's in these cases, it's around a round burr because the round is completely universal depending from which area you come. And to open um, the meatus, then probably a, a round one is good. You could also go probably for a, a neuro cutter, which also comes in a diamond coated version. This is a, the small cylindric ones with a round tip. So that would be possible too, but um, as I think it's better if Professor Nakamura or somebody else from the uh, surgeons answers that question. So, um, yes, if I may answer um, part yes, of the please. question. Yes, um, I, I would say that um, for internal auditory canal and also for, for the ACP drilling, uh, round shape is enough and um, round shape is, um, uh, is uh, suitable and um, should be preferred over other shapes. And, um, and also with, um, so um, usually, as you said, uh, uh, Mr. Mao said already, um, 
you only mostly need diamond and uh, and steel or uh, rosenberg. So uh, the other types with the coarse diamond, of course, you can you can try to use it, and it's it's I think um, it's um, it's suitable. But um, basically, if you uh, if you need to limit uh, your uh, burr tips, uh, then uh, then I would say um, diamond and burr and in round shape. Um, and uh, so the other uh, uh, other birds and very both gotten very nice different types uh, as uh, you showed um, Mr. Mauch already. Um, there are some which are suitable for spine surgery, like the barrel shaped ones, and so um, or the reverse tapered ones. And so I think um, there are some indications where you uh, where you can use the other um, shapes uh, in order to get more uh, quick surgery. You know? Thank you, Professor. Uh, concerning spinal orbital meningioma cases. Dr. Ari Fandoko from Bandung said, there are a lot of cases of spinoorbital meningiomas, which involves bony structures and hyperostosis. So there will be a lot of drillings. Any strategies for that, Professor? Well, for spinoorbital meningiomas, yes. Hyperostosis, um, yeah. Yes, uh, there's a lot of hyperostosis and, um, and uh, a lot of work is done extra drooling. And um, so I think um, so. There is a, a similar strategy that uh, that first with a with a, a larger larger burr and um, to get um, to to get more uh, further in the um, surgical uh, procedure, and then the surgical field gets narrower and narrower. And um, so at the point where you have got um, where you. Um, where you remove the, the bone of the, um, the lateral orbit and then go more infratemporally, uh, then um, there will be automatically um, the anatomical situation where you uh, choose a smaller burrs um, in order to get around, for example, to form rotundum and, uh, and any other structures and to, to, keep, um, to, uh, to, to remove uh, the bone there. Um, so um, what I do, I do mostly these uh, sphenoorbital meningiomas uh, through a pterinal um, craniotomy, which is extended more basally and infratemporal, but uh, basically the, um, um, the craniotomy itself um, is the same. And um, of course, um, one needs to mobilize the temporal muscle much more in order to get infratemporal. And I think um, that is, just um, at some some time, there is the limitation how far you can really go when the spinal orbital meningioma is really involving the whole um, temporal basal um, um, area. Um, it's just not possible to remove everything, and especially medially, you are just limited, and then you need to stop. And um, so, but uh, I think that is uh, just. Um, it's not worth um, to to get in these cases a complete radical resection because uh, because um, it's too traumatizing then uh, um, according to the to the surgical approach. So I um, our strategy is a little bit more conservative. So we concentrate on decompression of involved nerves, that is the optic nerve, and there is the nerves of the superior orbital fissure. And of course, uh, uh, just cor correcting the, um, um, the exophthalmus, um, so um, the eye position. And um, yeah, the proptosis, yeah. yeah that's the right. Yeah. Sorry, I <laughs> said it in German, yeah. <laughs> proptosis. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So, and that is, I, that is quite, I think sophisticated to get the proptosis in an order in an orderly position. Yes. Um, so one can debate what you do after surgical resection, after bone resection. You've got a very big space. Uh, you can use um, patients' um, individualized um, 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 CAT devices and um, and put that uh, three-dimensional CAT devices which you put in, or when 
the, when the tumor is not that large, I've got a series of patients uh, where when only the electoral wall, orbit wall, and the spinal wall is the attack, we just keep it and we do not um, don't put anything inside. But th that depends on the bone extension and the bone involvement, yeah. of course, the reconstruction procedure. Yeah. And you always cut the many orbital band, that's right. The meningo orbital band. Um, yes, most of the cases, yes, in order yeah. to get more space, yes. And then you, yes. you can retract the, the dura. Okay. Uh, because of time also, I would like to uh, invite two more panelists to ask some questions. Could you please raise your hand? Oh, Dr. Danny, uh, Dr. David, yeah, you raise your hand. Okay, uh, please unmute, please. Could you please unmute? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Nanda, as a uh, moderator, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nakamura. It's very nice, very nice uh, lecture, and very systematic for for us. Uh, from the uh, from, from step by step, you, you did uh, the lecture. Uh, I just have one question: If if in case of uh, traumatic optic neuropathy, neuropathy, um, do you prefer intradurally or extradurally um, to approach the uh, the depressed fracture to the can? Uh, Optic canal. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much for the question. Um, so I think first you need to see uh, where the, the where the uh, compression is. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got many um, optic nerve compressions from mm -hmm. uh, from bone fractures which come from medially. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so in these cases, um, you can remove it transnasally. So you yeah, can yeah. Okay. decompress the, the optic nerve transnasally. And um, so we do it together with the ENT surgeons and mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with the endoscope. That is a, a nice way to do, but only for, for the ones which can be treated transnasally from medial. And, um, and in, in, um, in uh, lesions or in traumatic lesions where uh, the uh, bone compression comes from the lateral uh -huh. wall um, with the with the optic nerve compression, we do it extra rurally then. So for, through um, a craniotomy. And um, so in order to just uh, remove the bone piece um, there. Um, so the approach just uh, depends on the direction of the compression and the origin of the um, of the compression. Okay. Thank okay. you, Professor. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question, probably from the panelists before we conclude this webinar. I mean, we've passed uh, <laughs> uh, the the planned time, Professor, but oh, it's, it's okay, okay because <laughs> we learned so much, and it was a very nice discussion uh, uh, because uh, a lot of questions have been asked and answered. So uh, if there is not, no questions anymore. So I would like to conclude this uh, webinar by giving a little summary by uh, what has mentioned by Professor Nakamura, how to avoid real complications that it is important to learn how to use the high-speed drill and also to know the pitfalls, yeah, the danger of using the high-speed drill. Of course, uh, mechanical damage or thermal damage has to be put in consideration. And for the residents, it's a step-by-step -step process. Then the younger residents will learn the perforators doing the, uh, for the bore holes first, doing the simple cryotomy. And later on in the third and fourth year, the high-speed drilling, they will learn. Uh, of course, you have to rest your hands. You don't have to put the hands in the air, but you have to rest so you can uh, <clears throat> don't do any damage. And the important 
thing is to know the size of the drill you are using. And it's important to use the larger uh, drills first. And after you finish your training, then you can proceed in learning and practicing the anterior craniodectomy for the paternal approach. And also uh, the retrosegment approach by drilling the AC without damaging the anatomical structures like the endolin sac or the jugular bulb. And of course, uh, Michael Mounch has uh, mentioned and gave to us his experience and knowledge by how to avoid jumping and chattering by using the angle, uh, a 45 angle uh, by putting the drill on the bone. And he showed us examples of drilling types and sizes and also the tips for correct treatment of burrs and the reuse only according to the surgeons, how to reuse their drill bits uh, for later on. So, um, I would like to uh, express my ex appreciation and also thanks to all the panelists who are, uh, who are here, who participated in the webinar. And I would like to also thank the committee and the collaboration from the Expo Lab Academy and the B Brown. And for me, uh, it's, uh, this is the end of the discussion. And I would like to hand over to the committee to Ms. Linda to close the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nanda. If I can applause, I will applause because this has been an interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, the time is delayed, but I think everybody really appreciated the time. You and Michael also thank you for this sharing expertise session from everybody. We really appreciate it. And um, thank you also to our line of expertise, Dr. Stiawidi, Dr. Sampo Azari, Dr. David Andian, Dr. Ande, Dr. Rian, Dr. Roland. Thank you so much, Dr. Selfie, Dr. Rahmat Andi, I saw you too. Um, Dr. Boyka, Dr. Hardian, thank you so much. Dr. Irwan, Dr. Danny, Dr. Calvin Mach, thank you so much for your time. Very honored and really appreciate the discussion we had this evening, this morning, or this afternoon, and looking forward to another collaboration with all of you. Thank you to all participants. Before we leave, before we leave to participants, please, we have a feedback polling in the screen in front of you. Um, if, you can, if you can fill in right now, it's just a very short polling. We we'll really appreciate your feedback about this webinar. So we'll just give a little bit of time. For all panelists, if you may just stay in the Zoom, don't leave yet, <laughs> we still have a farewell. With well, we cannot vote anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much to those who have filled in the feedback. Just a few more seconds. All right, so thank you. It's now to say goodbye time. Once again, thank you very much for joining in and thank you for our experts, speakers, moderators, and panelists. Thank you to our participants today. Thank you to our crew organizing team and also the Department of Neurosurgery, Faculty of Medicine, that's Indonesia and team. Thank you for B Brown Indonesia Global Regional. Thank you so much with the Escolab Academy team also. We look forward to see you in another webinar on neurosurgery update sessions next time. Take care and stay safe and healthy. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, Professor Nakamura, thank you very much. Feeling done for Alice, yeah? Professor. <laughs> yeah, you can I'm mission do it express and you have you have a, an uncle in Köln in Köln Lindenthal. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh,
Wie viele Jahre waren Sie in Deutschland? Bitte? Uh, how, how many years have you been in Germany? Well, I learned German in, in, in Wien. Oh, great. <laughs> Right. And Dr. Stiovidi can also can speak German. Also. <laughs> he was in Berlin. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. So uh, I hope that, um, you know, I hope that the COVID situation will change and uh, that you can, uh, and I would really like to work on you here in Cologne. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. You will. Thank you. Okay. Can you Vielen Dank auch, Michael. Bitte ja. schön. Danke schön. Danke schön. Okay. So, bis bald, ja. Yeah. Auf Wiedersehen. Okay. Wiedersehen. Kelvin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you so much once again, all panelists. Thank you so much for your time. Goodbye. Looking forward to another collaboration. Thank you, Dr. Roland. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Roland, Dr. Selfie. Selfie. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Stuvidi. Olga and Annette. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bleib gesund alles, ja? Vielen Dank, Dr. Boyke. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Später. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calvin, for joining in. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Professor, thank you so much once again oh, for your time. So for organizing everything. And um, so I hope that uh, that um, um, the feedback is okay, and uh, that um, you know that at some time we could uh, maybe uh, repeat uh, the webinar again. Yes, yes, Professor. Yes, we, like we hope we can repeat it here. in Surabaya, maybe. Well, Linda. Yeah, of course. Doctor okay. Boyka, Doctor Rahardian here have a very nice lab in. Um, we tried it with um, Dr. Charlie Teo before, so we would like to invite you again next time, Professor. Oh, thank you very much. I miss convenient, of course, after the week. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much, Professor. And everybody, Michael, Holger, and yeah. Annette, thank you very much for your collaboration yeah. and coordination with Professor okay. and everybody. And Linda, you, you will... You will then uh, give us the um, the result of the polling. Yes, of course, there will be. And I'm interested to see uh, results. What kind of yeah. Feedback we got, and um, if we got a, a very good feedback, we can maybe think about doing some other kind of uh, webinars in the future. Yeah. Of maybe course. And make a little series of that because I think it was quite good. Great, great, Michael. We will, and there's also a recording of this uh, session, so we will share it also to you. Perfect. All right. All right then. Thank you so much das once again. Amor, vielen Dank für die Unterstützung. Ja, so. vielen Dank auch. Ja. Yeah. And Thanks. apologize for the delay, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's just so interesting. <laughs> We cannot stop. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. I'm really happy to do this, and uh, so it was really fun. And thank you very much for organizing. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Say goodbye. All right. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.